Hello and welcome to Stow Talks, a series of videos designed to support people going through a relationship breakdown and all of the challenges this brings. I'm Matthew Taylor. And I'm Lisa Gatchell, family lawyers at Stowe Family Law. And in each episode, we bring in some of the amazing professionals we work with so they can share their advice and expertise on a range of issues from co-parenting to financial advice to dealing with challenging ex-partners. Today, we are joined by Sarah Davison, one of the UK's leading divorce coaches and NLP master practitioner with 26 years of coaching experience as she shares her advice on how to parent alongside a toxic or abusive partner. Best known as the divorce coach, Sarah has created revolutionary new ways to cope with breakups and divorce. Combining coaching skills with her own personal experience, she runs a unique program to help anyone battling a breakup. Best-selling author of Uncoupling, How to Survive and Thrive After Breakup and Divorce and The Split, she is also the creator of Breakup Recovery Retreats, which have been credited as being transformational and life-changing. Commissioned for a TV show, Heartbreak Hotel, they have quickly become the new way to cope with a breakup in the UK. She also runs a podcast called Heartbreak to Happiness. A patron of domestic abuse charity, The Dash Charity, Sarah recently launched the UK's first dedicated retreat called How to Divorce an Abusive Partner and Recover from a Toxic Relationship to empower those feeling helpless and give them the critical tools they need to break free so they can start their healing journey and redesign their lives. Welcome, Sarah, and thank you for joining us today. Having to parent alongside a toxic or abusive ex-partner presents so many unique challenges. So what firstly is a toxic ex-partner? Well, a toxic or abusive ex-partner is somebody that is not just having a bad day. I think a lot of people don't even realise that they're in a, an abusive relationship. Quite often, they think that things have just normalised over a period of time and that bad behaviour has become somewhat acceptable as it's minimalised. So I think it's a really good question to understand what is abuse and how do you recognise the signs? Because actually, I have clients coming to me who don't even know that they're in toxic relationships as I'm sure you do too. Mm. So it is really important to know that this is not your partner having a bad day. This is not an argument because, you know, healthy relationships, there are arguments and disagreements, right? So, so this really is where there is ongoing toxic behavior. So that could be lying. It could be gaslighting, which is a term that we hear a lot more these days. I'm really mm. pleased to see that it is on television a lot more with dramas like Dr. Foster and those kind of things that have come out now. So shining a light on that. But gaslighting is confusing behavior. So maybe saying something is a certain way when, when it wasn't. Or, or taking a situation and twisting it so that the meaning is different. Just leaving you feeling completely confused. So if you are feeling confused in a relationship, that could be gaslighting. Um, the lying, obviously, is something that is consistent over a long period of time. And these are things that go on belittling, name-calling, putting you down isolating you from friends and family again that's a huge thing and again it may not be obvious at the beginning it may just be oh you know I don't really fancy going to see your parents this weekend mm. can we can we miss it and then it might be over you know a longer period of time that you still haven't actually gone to see your parents or connected with those friends and then it might change slightly to oh well you know I'm not sure they're good for you so it may not be direct you may not be saying you know this this toxic ex may not be saying no you can't see those people but it's it's slowly isolating you over a long period of time. I think that incremental nature mm. kind of rings true to us. That's a lot of what, what, what certainly I hear from clients who come to us and it's almost like a, a bit of a, a creep throughout the relationship where there's a build-up. Is that, is that a really common way that these behaviours kind of develop? Yeah, absolutely. It's a bit like the boiling frog syndrome, yeah. you know. You, you don't notice it. If that partner was as, as unkind or cruel even to you as they were on the last day of the relationship, as they were on the first day, most of us would never have got into mm. those relationships. And I'm a survivor of abuse myself, so I know what it's like. Um, you know, it does creep up slowly slowly and then slowly you know, the water starts boiling and then you're you're in it but then it's very hard to get out mm. so yeah it's a really good point and how do friends and family help in these situations because i i can imagine perhaps they can see changes in behavior particularly if they're feeling that they're being isolated um, from the person and it might be something that they want to raise but is there a way that that can be done or are they you know how does that work it's a really good question because a lot of times people don't see it 
because it's behind closed doors. And often the perpetrator will be very charming, mm. very charismatic. Um, and so people think, gosh, they're the life and soul of the party. They're great fun to be around. And often they are in those scenarios, but behind closed doors it's very, very different. So it, it, some people obviously will notice the shift and change. And it can be really hard to bring up because quite often talking about it is not something that victims of abuse find easy to do. They're either worried or they're worried they'll get hurt or caught out talking about them. And sometimes they think it's them because this is really common. It's, it's all designed to make you feel that you're the problem. But the really important message is that it's not your fault. It's never your fault. Unfortunately, by um, you know, we, we do enable the behavior because a lot of the times we don't stand up. We don't say, no, that's unacceptable. Don't call me that or don't do that or I'm leaving. Whereas you know, other people would. So this is why empathetic people tend to get drawn into these relationships because they think, oh, well, I can fix it or I can adjust myself or I'll take that on. I know that they're having a bad day, so I'll, I'll just suck that up and I'll get on with things. I don't want conflict. So quite often by doing that, it's not their fault, but they are also enabling that behaviour to carry on because you don't say no. You don't stand up for the boundaries and say, that's not okay. So this is how we sort of get stuck into these relationships. Well, there's quite a fine line, I think, between enabling and self-preservation because most, a lot of that behaviour from the, uh, the victim is just about often getting through a day or a week or an hour, isn't it? So that probably reinforces the behavior to a degree yeah absolutely it is it's about self-preservation it's about not poking the the lion yeah you don't yeah. want to go up and say well that's not okay because you know there might be some sort of repercussion there for you or consequence and that's another one of the signs that she met it's walking on eggshells mm. so thinking gosh well if i do react to that then that's going to ruin this evening or if i do do that then they might be angry with the kids so i'm just not going to say anything so again it's it's walking on eggshells and never really knowing what's going to happen next and it's really easy isn't it for third parties to to look in on what is a toxic or abusive relationship and say why don't they just leave so yeah. you know why do people stay for so long potentially in these abusive relationships I mean it's, it's a good question I think we, to answer that we've got to look at why do we get into those relationships mm -hmm. because I think you know knowing what we know at the end we definitely wouldn't be getting in on day mm -hmm. one so so you don't see it but this this tactic which you've probably heard of called love bombing is a really common uh, technique that's used to sort of sucker people into those relationships so what, what love bombing refers to is that they make you feel a million dollars so it might be um grandiose promises that they're going to look after you forever you're never going to be lonely they might um, treat you to nice restaurants or holidays anything like that to make you feel very very special in fact it's almost too good to be true it's sort of you're put on top of that pedestal and you think gosh this is amazing this is what I've been waiting for all my life and they'll be reinforcing those messages however we're falling in love then with who they want us to see mm. them as now, for some of them, they are that person. There are glimmers of time where they are that person. But for others, it's a complete facade. And it, it's never really existed. So what happens is victims of abuse fall in love at that point, at that early stage, with who they perceive their partner to be. But then afterwards, their behaviour changes. And that is when we're sort of left thinking, gosh, well, I know that's possible, that good behaviour, because I've seen it. So it's that hope that we stay in there for and so that's who we fall in love with, but they don't really exist or only at glimmers of or short spaces of time do they ever really, be, are they that person, if ever. So I think when it comes to the end of relationships, we're looking at thinking, well, I just hope that they can go back to being the person I fell in love with. I know it's possible. And that cycle, there's a cycle of abuse where you, know, that you get hooked in. So there'll be really bad behaviour. So they'll be calling you names. There may be violence. There could be you know, anything. Oh, those are horrible things we were talking about earlier. But then as they sense you pull away, that's when they want to reel you back mm. in because they need you as much as you want to be in that relationship. So they will try and sucker you back in by being nice, being charming and showing you who you fell in love with. So you think, oh, OK, well, we're back to normal. If we can just carry on like this, then maybe I don't need to change my entire life and go through that divorce or that breakup. So we stay in it. But then again, once it settles down, and then it, the cycle repeats itself. So we're constantly in that, in that loop. So it's very, very difficult to get out because you may have kids, you may have financial struggles as well. You know, if you've got families, mm -hmm. that it can be really difficult just to leave. You might be worried about the impact on children or, you know, because you feel you still love this person, 
it's very hard when there are good days Mm -hmm. in inverted commas because they're not really good days um but because of that it keeps you keeps you locked in so does that typically mean it takes a few attempts for someone to leave an abusive relationship you know it's, it's rarely the case that they will go right that's it i'm done it will be repeated attempts and that getting sucked back in. Yeah, I mean, it's many, many times. I mean, many more than we think. So I think I think the stats are around eight or nine times to actually leave a, an abusive relationship, yeah. But you're so right. A lot of people will look and say, well, why don't you just get mm. out if it's that mm. bad? It's just never that simple. Okay, and, and then obviously we talk about abuse. And when you talk about domestic abuse, the first thought is within the marriage, within the relationship. But obviously that abuse can continue post-separation and cause problems. So how does that manifest itself? How is it different to the abuse during a relationship? Oh, that's such a good question. I'm so glad you bring it up <laughs> because post-separation abuse is huge. And I think, you know, I have a lot of clients coming to me who say, well, you know, my lawyer said, you know, well, at least you're out now and things will get better. And, you know, just from the day you separate, that is just not the case. Mm -hmm. For most people, if you're in an abusive relationship, you are going to suffer from post-separation abuse, which is horrific um, because all that bad behaviour doesn't just disappear. That Mm -hmm. lying, that gaslighting, confusing behaviour, that just gets moved into the divorce process, as I'm sure you guys see all the time. So that then it becomes, you know, paperwork or responding to lawyers or being honest or open or the child arrangements. Again, very common to mess around with the child arrangements or to use the children, manipulate the children in those circumstances. So, again, you know, that post separation abuse you know, can really hit people hard because they think, well, I'm out. But physical distance is one thing, but emotional torture that still happens, that emotional um, disassociation is very hard when you're getting letters through the lawyers that can be very, very controlling. Mm. And sometimes the lawyers become the mouthpiece for the abuse. So you feel like you're being attacked by even more people rather than just the one perpetrator. So what's your advice for somebody that has is just going through a separation at the moment, they're looking at divorce proceedings, they've got an abusive or toxic ex-partner, how should they be approaching those proceedings? Yeah, again, a great question, because this is really important to know that it's going to be different. If your friends have gone through a divorce and you'll have seen how difficult that was for them, I and mean, it was a healthy relationship. Now, a healthy relationship means they're still conflict right mm, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah you don't get yeah. many divorces without conflict <laughs> definitely we're all yeah, up on that yeah. exactly <laughs> but you know even the healthiest of relationships there's going to be disagreements okay and so when i have clients going through a, a healthy relationship divorce they might disagree over who gets the piano and how much time they spend with the kids yeah. but they both want a fair outcome ultimately for both people mm-hmm. right whereas when you are divorcing a toxic person then they want annihilation that's mm. it cause as much suffering, as much pain, and annihilate the other party at any cost, whether that's kids or finance or anything like that. So it's really important to know that it's going mm-hmm. to be different to your friend's journey who had maybe a more amicable divorce, even though there were arguments. Um, it is going to be different, and you do need to find a law firm like you guys who gets it, who understand that this is not going to be the normal run-of-the-mill divorce. They're going to be gaslighting on the paperwork. They're going to be throwing little grenades out to get your lawyers chasing up all sorts of things that are irrelevant. They're going to be very, very difficult, and they may well be hell-bent on getting their day in court, which, again, is very emotionally draining um, and, again, can trigger a lot of the trauma. And Safe Lives um, recently released uh, um, some research saying that over a, a third of um, people going through the family courts who were victims of abuse were re-traumatized by the family mm-hmm. court system, which again is shocking. So I think you know it's not just the financial cost of going through the family court system; it's also the emotional cost. Mm-hmm. So we really got to be clear and get support in place. So find somebody that can help support you, whether that's a domestic abuse charity or a coach like me who's trained to ha- help people, or some of my coaches I've trained to help people through these situations. I think it's really, really important to get a team in place who understand what you're going to be dealing with so they can best support you as a profession um what can we do to support clients that are in this situation you know, oh. we've talked about some of the yeah. things that lawyers do wrong <laughs> but you know which is absolutely fair enough but what what can we take on board to assist our clients 
Yeah, I think it's, well, One number one would be to learn how to spot the signs. If someone is a victim of abuse, being aware that they may not even know that, as we mentioned yeah. earlier, they may not even know that they're a victim of abuse mm -hmm. because it's become so normalised for them over the years. So again, spotting the signs of, you know, controlling behaviour and, you know, financial control obviously can be quite easy to spot. But there might be some less obvious signs where the, the victim just thinks it's all their fault all the time and particularly low self-confidence. So looking out for that and then getting them the right support because you know, you're lawyers, you're experts in the law, you're not experts in how to help someone through through this difficult process, but find somebody who is to help and support your, your uh, client through that. And also keeping up with the latest domestic abuse information and, and really just being on top of that, like you guys do, I think is really important. I think there's, um, there, there's quite a common trait in abuse victims, um, as far as I see it, is that they will hear the advice and listen to what I'm saying, but if their ex tells them something, they will be convinced that is true. And I completely understand why. And I'll have conversations with clients which are, okay, well, I'm telling you this and your ex who has been awful to you and you tell me is awful is telling you this. Why are you listening to what your ex-partner says rather than me? Yeah. Is that quite a common thing, that kind of defaulting to follow, following or following their lead on what they what they say? Because I, I find that crops up quite a lot. Yeah, that's really perceptive, Matt, because what happens is we become very dependent on them because they are you know, always quashing our own instinct. So when we're saying things like, well, I think this, no, no, you must be mistaken. You know, so very quickly, victims of abuse learn never to trust their own instinct. Mm. So they lose touch with that. So, and they've been trained over many, many years in a lot of these cases just to do as they're told. So they lose the ability to, well, well you, can, you can definitely get that back and that's what <laughs> I work with clients on, but they lose the ability to tap into that instinct and trust their own opinion. Yeah. So I think working on their self-reliance and decision-making, I always call their instinct there, it's like a burger alarm system, your internal burger alarm system. And what you'll find is most of those victims of abuse will pay more attention when their house alarm is going off than they will when their own internal <laughs> burger alarm is going off saying, don't do that, don't do that. But they're like, no, 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 I'm, I'm not going to listen to that mm. because they've been programmed that way so yeah it's really really common but again that's where a, a good coach or a good support worker from a domestic abuse charity can really do some work there to help them shift and it is literally about getting the what I call the gameplay checklist which is basically a, a list of all the behaviors the tactics that perpetrators will use so going back to lying and walking on eggshells making you feel uncomfortable making you doubt yourself all those different symptoms and, and experiences that you'll have when you're having a conversation or being affected maybe by an email from an ex. So how it works is instead of getting engaged with what your ex might be saying, you and going off on a you know down a rabbit hole chasing the distraction, what they'll be doing, the client will be then looking at the list, going, ah, okay, that's a distraction tactic, tick. Okay, that's a lie, tick. Okay, that's confusing, right, tick. Oh, that's making me doubt myself, tick. So instead of going off and getting upset and questioning and asking what I call those hamster wheel questions, like what's going on here, what's wrong with me, why am I confused? They're actually just disassociating emotionally and being able to tick it off, which has two big benefits. Number one, emotionally, they're learning to take their control back and regulate their own emotions. But number two, they're actually not, they're actually learning a lot about their ex so they can spot the signs, mm. which for your clients is going to be super important because most people who have been in toxic relationships will come out, go, okay, I'm out of that one eventually, and then go straight back into something that mm. is very, very similar because they haven't learned to spot the signs. And again, for clients, it's really important that we give them the safety net to understand that you know, learning to trust again is not about giving your trust to other people. It's about learning to trust yourself that you can make a better decision about who you're going to get into a relationship with. So this gameplay checklist will actually educate clients as they go. How would you say that it's different from counselling? I know you so you're a divorce coach. We hear a lot about coaching and counselling. Just so for anybody out there that might have had a family member or friend, professional say that you need some sort of counselling or coaching, how, what is the difference between those two things? Yeah, it's a great question. And I suppose, you know, I, I always a bit reticent on answering this question because everybody's different. So yeah. we've got some, you know, amazing counsellors, amazing therapists and great coaches too. So but everyone has their own styles. But if we're going to generalise, um, counselling and therapy are less directional. 
So you can't, so with a coach, so what I can do is I can say, well, you know, how about try this and do this and, and give an action plan at the end of every single session with each client so that they go away with ideas. They, um, I explain to them how they can dial down some of those negative emotions and take their power back. So it's not just hearing the story. It's very much more understanding where they've been, but we only hear that story once as a coach. So in my training schools, I train people to become breakup and divorce coaches as well. We, we all only listen to the full story from beginning to end in session one unlike some therapy, some counselling, where you'd be reliving that mm. quite often. Okay. As a coach, we're very much, right, you've told us, we'll get the updates, but we're very much on moving you forward from where you are now to where you want to be. So again, it's, it's much more directional and results focused. And so if you've come through a separation, you're, you are separating and you're looking to move on to the next stage in your life and you've got children with your ex-partner who's toxic and abusive and that behaviour continues, how do you manage to work together to parent your children. <laughs> work together, they're the words, Matt. <laughs> that, the, the, the magic words, and the answer is you don't? You don't, yeah. yeah. I mean, again, the thing is, we have to ask ourselves the question, how do I take my control back over this? Because quite honestly, with a lot of my clients around the world, this isn't just a UK thing, this is everywhere, you know, if you explain what you want from a very manipulative ex, they're going to do the opposite. Yeah. So yeah, it's very, very difficult when you have to set out, right, these are the arrangements because then they know what you want and then they're going to manipulate mm -hmm. that and let you down. So how do you take your control back? Well, first of all, you can't co-parent. It just isn't going to work because of exactly that. They're going to manipulate the situation. Um, because this is their only form of control over you after the finances are sorted, they're only left with the kids. So mm. all that behavior will go into manipulating that situation. So with the kids, we can parallel parent, which, I mean, can we? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because parallel parenting basically means that you don't agree on the small things. You basically, you know, allow your ex to do what they want to do in their home. You do what you do in your home. You set your own morals. You set your own boundaries and values for your kids, which is really important if the other parent isn't stable or healthy. So exactly, it's important for you to create that safe space for your children. However, par parallel parenting means you have to agree on schools yeah. <laughs> and healthcare. And I wonder how many clients you've had who come to you because they can't agree on schools or healthcare. Because but, I have once clinical. or twice it's happened. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, what we're doing is we're sort of cutting out the you know most of the battle, and we're just well, you're limiting the, the, you're limiting the areas of conflict, yeah. aren't you? It, yeah. it, rather than the co-parenting approach, which is we have a common set of rules and work between the two houses, and we try and be consistent as much as possible. I suppose if you're not arguing about staying up late, kids playing Xbox too much, you've still got big disputes, don't you? But yeah. I suppose it limits the, the, the amount that you have to engage with your ex yes. when they are toxic. Is, and that's, uh, is that not difficult for them to give up some of that control as well as parents? Because working with some clients, they want to know what the other person's... And not necessarily an abusive you know, ex-partner... Yeah but they want to know that the rules are the same in both houses, you know, that the children go, to, you know, they're, they're distraught if the children are staying up at nine o'clock there when they go to bed at 7.30 here, or, you know, they don't do their homework on Tuesday and Thursdays because that's the day when they do their homework with them. Um, so how does that work with that as well? Because I, I guess it's, you know, you have to be prepared to give up an element of, you know, control and discussion as yeah. well. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point because, you know, as I mean, I, I mean, from most of my clients are female, those who have male clients, but it is difficult. It is mm. difficult to give up that, you know, when you've been used to it. And most people will say, Sarah, I never signed up to not putting my kids to bed every night. Mm. You know, both sides. No, nobody has kids to then say, well, I'll see you once every yeah. you know, seven days. It's just it, it's just not how we, we get into the relationship. So there is a period of adjustment and it can be really hard for some people more than others. And again, that's where a good coach comes in because it's all about focusing back on them and what do they want from from you know to help them balance that because mm -hmm. we can't control what the ex is doing so actually what it is is wasted energy because you know if you're saying oh look please can you put them to bed but maybe they don't get back from work till seven or eight o'clock so they want that extra time if it's a healthy relationship it might be just doing it because they want to connect mm -hmm. with their kids so again we've got a there's a lot of work that we can do behind the scenes there to help people sort of rebalance and just after being with the kids for so long and then changing that routine it is a big adjustment and I think it's one of the hardest adjustments with divorce is for mm. both sides is, is how do you handle not seeing your kids and what do you do with yourself in that time but there are lots of things you can do and you know you can be um, work on yourself and create lots of opportunities so you're a better parent when your kids are around as well 
Yeah, you need to develop that dual focus instead of being a constant. I mean, you're always a parent. You're always there. You're always there for them. But you're not such an active parent during those periods. And you need to be able to replace that, I, I think, to give yourself another focus. Because otherwise, you, I find that clients, you, you fixate on what's happening when you're not yeah. there. And that must be especially difficult in an abusive relationship. Um, I was wondering what the difficulty must be is what happens if the children start to come back from the ex-partner's house and saying daddy doesn't do this or mummy doesn't do this or, or you start to and you start to recognize some of those behaviors repeating how mm. do you deal with that with your clients when yeah. they are seeing sort of echoes of the behaviors from their ex-partner yeah that is a really good point and it's and it's really scary as as a victim of abuse to have your child still going to that household now it's really important that your child has a good relationship with both parents as long as it is safe to do so mm. Okay, so that's the most important thing, as long as it's safe. If it's not safe, then obviously that's you don't want your child going somewhere they don't feel safe either. However, bad-mouthing your ex is a big no-no, and, and so there's really fine lines, and I work really carefully with a lot of my clients on this because you know, it is a very difficult area when, they're, when the children are coming back and reacting in a certain way. The easy thing to say is, oh, you're just like your other parent, mm. which you know, is not how to handle this. Having your own values and morals and behaviour code in your house is really important. And then by contrast, your child will see when they go to the other parent, OK, when I go to that house, there's shouting and bullying. But when I'm in this house, there's no shouting. It's not allowed. There's no bullying. There's there's no lying. Lying is, is, is a big no-no. And then hopefully your friends and your family will reinforce that as well. So that, you know, on this side, you've got all these morals and behaviours, how you would like to shape mm. your child ideally. And when they they go to the other parent instead of saying well when you're there I know you see all this they're just experiencing it and they know it's not right so as they grow up they've got a very safe stable uh, basis from you and in fact a lot of parents will be super worried about this and they'll say sorry no but you know how are they going to grow up kids only need one healthy sane parent who gives them unconditional love they only need one and that's been proven time and time again. So again, it's not about jumping on and criticizing. It's about rewarding for the positive behavior, rewarding for the kindness, for the empathy, the things that the perpetrator will not have. Mm. And then, you know, making sure that they recognize those traits is super important. Like, even more important than algebra. You know, like, <laughs> if you're kind... Surely not. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We, we just had every uh, maths teacher turn off. <laughs> uh, but I think that's a really good point about positive yeah. behavior reinforcement. It, it's focusing on the positives. After, But that must be tricky after such a negative oh, experience. Yeah. To be able to have a positive outlook and it sounds like you've got a positive outlook having been through your own experiences yeah i mean that must be incredibly challenging and must take i would imagine a fair amount of time to get to that point uh it can do but it is about a decision it's a decision to say i am not gonna let that affect me or impact the rest of my life so it's kind of a screw you watch this okay. attitude yeah. and if you can grab that early on and go I know it's not going to be easy there's going to be some ups and downs but if you've got people around you that understand if you've got people that have maybe walked in those shoes before you so they can guide you then I think it becomes a lot easier and also as parents we'll do more for our kids than we will for ourselves so if you know mm. you're doing the right thing by your kid and you know that by reacting in a certain way, you are helping them, then a lot of my clients will do more to, to protect their kids and do the right thing and show them, lead by example, rather than, you know, by, by bad-mouthing the other side. And as you know, you know, the, the, um, the bad-mouthing or, or any of that can be completely taken out of context. And, you know, parental alienation is being weaponized mm. by some law firms against victims of mm. abuse. So, again, you've, the clients have got to be super, super careful because in some cases the family courts are just not fit for purpose and what's happening is just horrendous for victims of abuse. So what is the best process then? If, if the me mediation tends to be a no-no as far as... I'm concerned with abuse victims. Maybe I'm wrong on that. So the instinct is say, well, if you can't sort things directly and they're being ridiculous, we're going to need court proceedings. But you're absolutely right that in some respects, the family court has not historically, I think, slowly improving, but it's not been a great situation for abuse victims and it can be used as a tool of continued abuse by the perpetrator. Yeah. So what methods do you advise as being most appropriate for people trying to sort out arrangements for children with an abusive ex-partner? I wish there was an answer for that. Mm. <laughs> I really do. Um, how I see it is that your average mediation is not going to work because yeah. you're 
you know, and having done it, I was advised to go through it. So okay, I've done it. Right. And it was hell. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and mediation just isn't set up for that. And also mediators aren't experts in spotting the signs of abuse, even though some of them are pretty good at it. Most of them probably won't. And it's not their, you know, it's not their main, main uh, focus. But it is super important that you don't put a victim in abuse in that sort of triangular situation because in those in those situations like mediation the perpetrator will perform and they will be very charismatic and very understanding and the mediator won't even pick up on that look or the tonality yeah. it can just be the way they say a certain word that the victim will feel so again yes you're right i don't i don't think that normal mediation would work however you know we have shuttle mediation uh, we have a hybrid now, mm -hmm. which That's actually coming more and more popular. Yeah. And, you know, to be honest, it's not the perfect solution either. But going to the family court, which in my <laughs> my podcast, I just call the casino. You may as well forget court. <laughs> um, you know, it's such a lottery on, you know, when you, I remember being shocked when I went in and my lawyer said to me, oh, good, we've got this judge or, oh, no, we've got this judge. I'm like, hang, hang on. Surely it's not dependent on the judge. It's dependent on my case. But no, you know, there's so many moving parts, so many different innate biases that have, are in that system and court experts don't get me started there. So, you know, I just think that that is not fit for purpose for victims of abuse and yeah. whilst you know it's encouraging to hear you see so improvements there just are not enough and most people are coming out in a lot worse situation not just financially because it's very expensive but also the emotional abuse from going up against a barrister say in the box mm. who of your perpetrator is just I mean it is you know it's serious serious trauma that is being caused to victims so I think in answer to your question probably there is no good solution if you can get into like a hybrid mediation and try that out, I think that might be best for the emotional, uh, your emotional state of mind. But again, you know, are you going to get the fairest mm. answer from that? Is you know, still agree, you know, hoping that everyone's going to agree on some level. And most perpetrators will want their day in court. That's what mm -hmm. they want. So you won't have a lot of choice. You are quite limited. I think hybrid mediation and just to pick that slightly, that's lawyer assisted mediation. So it's yourself. It's not the traditional mediation of parties in a room with a neutral third party. And it's really interesting what you say about tonality on comments mm. and the little triggers. Hybrid mediation, you bring your lawyer in. So you've got your kind of team and your backup but it's still trying to sort things out between yourselves. So I guess you're less, I quite like the casino analogy, <laughs> less of the spin of the roulette wheel. Yeah. It's difficult, isn't it? Because the law is, in this country, very subjective. So when we talk about financial settlements, we talk about fairness. When we talk about children, child arrangements, we talk about the welfare of the child. Now, what's fair and what's in a child's welfare? I'm sure the three of us here would have, could have potentially very different views on that. And, you know, certainly I always say to clients, if we go to court, it will depend on what the judges, mm. what their personal experience has been, the cases that they've dealt with, they will form a view. And ultimately, you're putting your future and your child's future and your financial circumstances into the hands of a third party. And there isn't any guarantee with it. So, I, you know, I completely understand what you're saying when you say it is a bit of a... It's a bit of a casino and a bit of a lottery because there's just no guarantees. And there's also no compulsory training for any legal professional in domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. So when you've got judges or barristers or even lawyers talking about these things, you know, if, if they don't understand it, then that charismatic person in the box compared to the victim of abuse who's shaking, maybe is a bit angry because everything she's said or done, or not always she, but majority, mm -hmm. has been twisted so that make her look in a certain way, again, it, it, it just, you know, if, if they don't understand this, which they don't, um, and you've got experts going in there who aren't qualified in this either, it's a, it's a big mess. It's a big mess, but it's lives we're messing with. And mm -hmm. I think that's where the trauma statistics are coming from, that it's, that, you know, decisions are made that are, you know, reprehensible and things are going on that shouldn't in this day and age. So what do you think are the what is there anything that you'd like to see changed whether it's in the court system or or wider in society or whatever it may be what things do you think would need to change to make for better outcomes for uh, abuse victims i think compulsory domestic abuse training regularly every year to be updated for all legal professionals is essential but i don't think you're going to change some of the deep-seated deep-rooted 
beliefs of some people in that system just from a day's training. So, so but that would be a good start because I think a lot of people would um, be able to at least start to spot some of the signs or be able to recognise that things maybe aren't quite as they seem. So I think that is is going to be really important. But I also think we should have specialists in domestic abuse working alongside lawyers and alongside the family court system because again, you know, can't expect you guys to be all experts mm. in everything. You can you know have a level of understanding, but again having someone in the system that if there is any alleged abuse is there for each case to assess it who is properly qualified and independently verified um, and monitored and regulated so that we know we've got good people good support for clients going through the system and that if there is abuse it will be flagged up and they will be protected I think that's the only way to get a fairer outcome for victims of abuse. Moving on a little bit from the actual dispute point and let's say you, you you've worked with a client for a little while and they've come through the end of their proceedings or whatever and they've got a broad agreement and obviously an abusive partner is likely to mess with that going forwards but <laughs> things are as settled as they might ever be we talked a little bit before about trust so i'm really interested in hearing how um abuse victims can empower themselves to kind of move on to the next chapter in their lives and, uh, and kind of survive it and bec- become a survivor and, uh, and be able to develop and, and thrive well, what do you say to clients about how to kind of develop those skills yeah i mean and it can seem impossible at the beginning so if people are, are listening or watching this and they're thinking i'm never going to be able to do that you will Um, And it's about taking that pain and turning it into your power. It's about taking that adversity and making it your strength. You know, if you've gone through this, you can get through anything. And if you have kids, then using, you know, that motivation to drive you forward, that you're going to be a role model for them, that they're not going to see you falling into the same traps time and time again. I think it comes down to education. It's about playing with the gameplay checklist and spotting the signs. It's about when I when I teach my clients um, about dating again, you know, a lot of people are like, I'm never going to date ever again. I hate all men. I'm never going to do it. And it's understandable, right? But But actually, it's not about trusting somebody else giving your trust away it's about learning to trust yourself to make those better decisions so understanding what those early red flags are because they are always there you know sometimes we push them down sometimes we don't look at them sometimes they oh i'll change that but actually if someone tells you who they are and maybe they show you who they are then listen you know Mm -hmm. take note you know that is who they are if someone's saying oh my mom tells me sometimes i'm selfish they're selfish right they're not going to you know you're not going to be able to change that And also knowing that if that comes up, knowing what your deal breakers are, and if if they come up, for example, being rude or lying or being unkind, if that comes up, then deploy your parachute and exit the building immediately Mm. rather than giving them a chance to do it again. Okay, so it's about setting your own boundaries. It's about learning and banking those lessons because otherwise life's going to keep on teaching us them. So it's it's really about self-empowerment and taking your control back and saying, this isn't going to happen to me again. And just being kind to yourself and recognising that, you know, sometimes we're going to make mistakes, but as long as we learn from them and turn that pain into our power, we can move forward and be really happy again and, mm. and go on and have healthy relationships in the future. And break that repeating pattern, Yeah, I suppose, absolutely. particularly if they have been in, as you say, they're more likely to, if they don't get assistance, go back into another abusive relationship. So actually, by the time you're dealing with their divorce proceedings, this might actually be their fourth or fifth abusive relationship so this is just a pattern they've done I think it's really easy isn't it sometimes we're we're all looking for the Disney fairy tale so at the beginning of a relationship if you are being wined and dined and all these lovely things are saying you might miss those those red flags that are that, that are there just at the beginning yeah I always say that my clients when they first come to me they have they have two two criteria for meeting a new partner one they have a pulse and two, <laughs> and two they show them one sign of affection and then they yeah. go into what I call limpet mode and sort of sucker themselves yeah. to this poor person thinking I'm never going to be alone again because that's our greatest fear after a breakup with a toxic yeah. person you're going to be on your own you've probably been told you'll be on your own that no one will love you you're not attractive And so all those fears are there. So yeah, you're so right. We need to learn to understand what those signs are and just get out. No second chances, no second dates. Just get out if it's not what you think it should be. Yeah, and do the work with somebody like you so that they feel comfortable in their own skin. Because if you're comfortable with yourself, you're then coming to a relationship as equals, aren't you? Rather than expecting all of this from your partner, being fulfilled from your partner. 
Yeah, it's a two-way street, you know, and, and looking for someone else to fill the gaps in you mm. is never going to work. We've got to be able to be whole and be happy to spend time on ourselves and start trusting our own instinct and our burger alarm system and building those muscles up because then you're a more attractive package anyway for someone coming through the door. So again, you're more likely to form a healthy relationship than someone that you're dependent on again. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us. Thanks for having me. You can find out more about all the work that Sarah does supporting people going through a relationship breakdown at her website, saradavison.com. If you are at any immediate risk from domestic abuse, please call the police. You can also access help and support from the 24-hour National Domestic Abuse Helpline on 0808 2000 24-7. Please do reach out for help if you need it. In our next episode, we'll be joined by the divorce doctor, Dr. Sue Palmer-Con, as we look at the issues faced by women and their partners as they deal with divorce or separation during the menopause. So that's it for this episode of Stowe Talks. Thanks for joining us. We hope you found it helpful and informative. If you would like more information on future videos, our podcast series and programme of webinars, head over to stowtalks.co.uk where you can sign up for our email list as well as check out our previous episodes and forthcoming events. And please do rate, like, share and review where you can. Thank you and see you next time. Ooh.